Hey everyone, as you can tell, we've got a little bit of a new look. Invoke AI is now Invoke. We're the same team and the same company building open source software for creatives, but we've now released our enterprise product to help larger creative teams at game studios, agencies, and in media and entertainment companies use these tools securely and deploy them at scale across their teams. Their support helps Invoke continue to develop great software for everyone and release our studio for free as an open source product. In this video, we'll talk about getting started with Invoke. Alongside the changes to our name, there's a new user interface, which I expect will continue to evolve over time as we invest in building the latest in AI directly into the studio. For the sake of new users who may just be discovering Invoke and the suite of tools that are available, I'm gonna walk through and give a brief explanation of how it can be used and what it's for. I'll also pepper in new enhancements in the user interface and cover some of the basic use cases that people might wanna try when getting started with the tool. The Invoke user interface continues to be broken down by our options panel, the work area, and our gallery. The options panel allows you to switch between different modalities and workflows, update your generation settings, and offer some of the most powerful control capabilities available to professionals on the market. The work area allows you to review all of the images that have been generated in the studio, letting you toggle between different generations that you have created in order to review them, as well as access additional information for those images. You can control a full suite of image actions, such as opening in a new tab, downloading, sending to other tabs like image to image or the unified canvas. You can also easily pull the prompt, the seed, the size, or all of the parameters for the image directly into your options panel. You can review the metadata for your image and pull individual parameters directly into your options panel, and you can turn on or turn off the display of progress images. Your gallery is split between your boards and your images and assets. Each board can store images, which are the generations that you produce in the studio, or assets, which are images that you upload in order to use for things like ControlNet or IP adapter. You can take any image that you've created and drag that either into the workspace, to other boards, or to some of the other image-based drop zones like ControlNet or IP adapter. Let's go ahead and break down the options panel for the basic text-to-image generation tab. Text-to-image allows you to generate a new image using a text-based prompt. If you've used other image generators like Midjourney or Dolly, you've likely realized that the prompt that you type in isn't the actual prompt being passed into the model. While this is a very nice feature for new users who may not understand all of the prompt terminology they want to include, it can pose a risk to professionals who want full control and assurance that their prompt isn't being augmented with terms that are misaligned with the aesthetic that they're going for. In Invoke, all of the terminology that you utilize is what is passed into the model. I'll go ahead and clear these out so we can see the tooltip labels. Here you can see that we have two prompt boxes, our positive prompt and our negative prompt. Each prompt box also has additional features such as adding embeddings, which are kind of like condensed prompts that you can use to control the image generation process. For SDXL models, which are a certain type of model that will generate larger images, you can turn off the concatenate mode to expose additional style prompt boxes. By default, we're going to have this turned on to concatenate mode, which just means that we're using the same prompt in both of those boxes. This is the standard way to utilize the model, but if you want more control over which prompt is being passed into each of those encoders, you can split this up and control that directly. Lastly, the dynamic prompts preview has been added into the positive prompt box. You can click this to see any of the dynamic prompts that you're using to generate. Just to give you an example of how that works again, if we type in red, green, and blue inside curly braces and separated by a pipe, you'll notice that our system is processing each of those prompts and will generate three images, one for red, green, or blue. If we wanted to have this be red, green, or blue ball, we'll go ahead and type the rest of that prompt outside of those curly braces and see that the 
dynamic prompts is going to automatically create that. You can control the seed behavior here to use a different seed for each image or keep the seed the same across each iteration. Iterations are now controlled through the top menu. You can choose the number of images that you want to generate, or if dynamic prompts is enabled, the number of dynamic prompt sets that you want to have generated. The image accordion is now where you're going to control the majority of the settings related to image size and the starting noise. You'll notice that when you switch models, this is automatically going to be optimized to the default size appropriate for that model architecture. If you update your width or height, you will see a convenient preview of the aspect ratio that you're going to end up generating. You'll also see a warning when your size may be too small. This is going to be automatically calculated when you are outside the bounds of a specific model architecture and when the image might end up being generated with aberrations or undesirable artifacts. You can click the optimize size for model button to revert back to the default for that model. If you have an aspect ratio locked, when you move up and down, that aspect ratio will be maintained. If you hit the optimize size with an aspect ratio selected, it'll optimize the size of your generation to match the model while keeping the aspect ratio locked. Generation controls that involve the image but aren't always needed to be exposed are expandable in the advanced options section. You can leave this open if you want these controls available at all times, but you can easily contract that when you don't need those options anymore. This will be where settings like the seed, high resolution fix on text to image or denoising strength on other tabs is gonna be located. We'll cover advanced options in another video if you're a new user. For now, just focus on the generation size here and make sure that you're using an optimal size for the model that you have selected. The generation accordion now shows your models and your concepts. Your models tab will show all of the models that you have loaded into your Invoke Studio. And you can also expand your advanced options to choose things like the scheduler, steps, and CFG scale for the generation. In a future release, we'll tie controllable defaults for a lot of these settings directly to the model to allow you to input things like a scheduler, steps, CFG scale, a VAE, whatever you typically have to fiddle with to make sure it's perfect for each model, you'll be able to do that directly from a model configuration. And these things will just change for you as you switch the model. If you want to leave these open in the meantime, again, just expand the advanced options and leave this open as you generate. The Concepts tab will show all of the LoRa's that you have loaded. LoRa's are a great way to add new concepts like characters, styles, features, composition elements directly into your images. We anticipate this year that additional new concept technologies will be developed, and that's why we've listed this as the Concepts tab rather than the LoRa's tab. The next section, Control, is where you'll be able to use things like ControlNet, IP adapter, and T to I adapter to control the composition of your images. ControlNet and T to I adapter are technologies that allow you to pass in an input image, have certain characteristics from that image analyzed, for example, the edges using a canny model, the depth using a depth model, or poses from characters in the image. Each of these tools is an advanced capability that you can use to control the composition of your outputs. You can also combine these together. IP adapter allows you to pass in your images for use as references. This is a great way to blend concepts and styles together into a final resulting output. When you want to use one of these features, such as Canny for passing in a sketch or photo, you can simply drag the image into the control adapter, have it processed to find the characteristics of the image that will control the generation, and then generate with that enabled. For SDXL model, the Refiner tab controls Refiner settings. I won't go deep into these as many of the SDXL fine tunes no longer use the Refiner. But if you're a fan of using the Refiner model, you can read documentation to better understand how to utilize the Refiner in your generations. The last tab, Advanced, is for less commonly used settings that are typically managed on a per model basis. This is also where you'll find seamless tiling 
in order to generate assets that have blended edges and can be tiled for textures and materials and patterns. The image to image tab has largely not been changed aside from the options panel updates we've already walked through. You can drag any of your images into the initial image section in order to have this serve as an initial representation of color and structure in your generation process. This is a great way to control the shape and the coloring of the outputs that you're generating. Your denoising strength is going to be listed in the advanced options here. A lower denoising strength will look more like your initial image and a higher denoising strength will look more varied from your initial image. One feature that I'll call out that's extremely helpful on the image to image tab is the use size button. When you use this, it'll update your width and height to match your initial image and ensure that you don't get any misshapen images as an output. We'll go ahead and drag an image into our unified canvas in order to talk about some of the changes to the canvas. The unified canvas allows you to make updates and do direct manipulation on certain parts of the image that you want to either change the details for or update to include more details. With the scale before processing feature, smaller bounding boxes that would typically generate at a smaller size, in this case 320 by 320, will scale up the image before processing in order to maximize the amount of detail that can be created using the model you currently have selected. For SDXL, this will default to 1024 by 1024, or the optimized width and height based on your aspect ratio. We'll go ahead and give this a go just to showcase the capability. I'll use the prompt from our previous generation and we'll select the face in order to regenerate his facial features. We'll go ahead and generate two iterations and invoke. As in previous versions, we can easily switch between which generation we prefer and accept to commit that to the base layer. One change in the latest version of Invoke is that you can now generate on the unified canvas in multiples of eight. When dragging to scale the bounding box, you'll still see the default width and height lock in at a grid size of 64 pixels. But if you want to utilize the eight pixel multiples, just hold down the shift key as you're scaling the bounding box. This can also be used when you're dragging around the grid with snap to grid on, it'll default to 64 pixels, but if you hold shift down, you'll see that it goes to a much more specific eight pixel snap. The compositing section on the unified canvas has the coherence pass and infill tabs. When generating on the unified canvas, a specialized workflow, which uses a second generation to produce additional matched details is run called the coherence pass. Modes can be controlled for how this second generation process is run and whether it applies to the entire unmasked image, only the masked section of the image, or just the edges of the mask that you have selected. The steps and strength of your denoising process for that second pass are controlled here, and how that second pass is blurred into the original image is controlled using the blur method and the blur setting. The infill tab controls the infill method for filling in any transparent areas of an image before the generation is run. On a fully configured system, you'll have four options, tile, llama, CB2, and patch match. I recommend looking at the documentation if you're curious at how these infill methods work. Typically, the majority of users will find patch match to be the easiest to use and the one that generates the most coherent results with your image. Each of the infill methods will have any of their options displayed underneath them. Lastly, let's talk about the workflow editor. A feature that has been released but not yet been covered is the workflow library. When you open up the workflow library, any workflows that you have saved to your local database will show up here. You'll also have access to a number of default workflows that come pre-installed with the system that you can load and then augment in order to generate new content within the workflow system. In this case, I've loaded up our tiled upscaling workflow, a new feature as of 3.5. Tiled upscaling allows you to mimic the results that you've seen in online tools like Magnific, Crea, and others directly in Invoke. Further, you can augment upscaling workflow 
with a high degree of control by augmenting the workflow itself. This tiled up scaling workflow is a great way to get started with a set of predefined and easy to use options directly in the linear tab. We'll go ahead and load the tiled up scaling workflow and take a look at some of the options. On the left hand side, you'll see things like the model you want to use, the image you want to upscale, how much you want to upscale it. For example, in this case, I've got it upscaling to two times the size of the original image how creative you want the model to be in augmenting details. This is actually just a easy way to control the denoising strength, the sharpening strength to help produce additional detail in the upscale, and structural control, which is controlling how the control net is applied to the image. Let's go ahead and give this a shot. And I'm gonna go ahead and add two more nodes. I'll press the space bar and add a current image node so that I can use the preview to watch the generation. And then at the very end, I'm actually gonna go ahead and update my save image to save to my invoke 3.6 board. You can choose any of the uh, boards that you have available using that dropdown. If you wanna update your prompts, you can. The default tiled up scaling workflow doesn't expose these in the linear view, but you can manipulate these directly on the nodes. This is one way that you can change the style of an image if you want to while you're upscaling. You'll just wanna make sure that your creativity setting is higher in order for the model to be able to inject that new style in. You'll also probably wanna use a model that's going to have some alignment with the type of style you're trying to change the image into. In this case, we're just going for a really clean upscale. So I'll leave the default settings and those prompts blank. Let's go ahead and generate one iteration of our upscaled image. We now have an upscaled version of our image. We'll go ahead and open the original and our upscaled version to compare the details. Looks like it did a pretty good job to me. Before we wrap up, we'll cover a couple of other small changes and tips and tricks. When you change models, your width and height will automatically change. Anytime you wanna reset any of the sliders in the application to their default, you can simply double click the slider in order to return that to the default value. Uh, this will work for any of the sliders in the left-hand UI. There's also a nice new hotkey menu that showcases all of the hotkeys that exist in the application. You can scroll up and down to see all of the hotkeys that exist. A few notable ones to call out, your invoke and cancel options here at the top. If we scroll down to your general settings, you'll easily be able to pull the prompt or the seed from any image you have displayed using the PRS keys. You can navigate your gallery and increase or decrease the image size using the gallery hotkeys. And all of the unified canvas hotkeys that have been previously covered are highlighted here as well. We're excited about Invoke and looking forward to continuing to develop the application for professional creatives. And if you're a professional creative working on a team looking to apply customized generative AI solutions into your creative pipeline, make sure to check out Invoke.com. You can learn more about the team, what we're building, and how we can help you succeed. If you're not a professional and you just wanna be a part of the community, make sure to join our Discord. Invoke is built by a community of collaborative, open source developers supported by our Invoke staff. We have plenty of ways for you to help us succeed as a project and we would love for you to join. Keep an eye out, we have more announcements coming. It's an exciting time and 2024 is gonna be even bigger for AI in 2023. As always, subscribe to continue to get the latest updates on Invoke. We've got a lot more coming.